people um, credit you with paving the way for uh, President Trump, and you have said that you are ready to do more. Now, might that be in um, it's sort of in union with President Trump, or might that be as a rival to him? Well, I think already, presently, uh, President Trump and I um, work in certainly different realms, but uh, on uh, common policy, on trying to let the public know what uh, is best for America when it comes to our sovereignty and our solvency. So already, I think we work together on quite a few issues. Well, uh, Sarah, first of all, it's Piers here. Good morning to you. Good morning. We've had a... <laughs> Just to explain to viewers, we, we've locked horns over the years, but it's a, it's a delight that we managed to put our differences beh behind us and we're now we're united across the Atlantic on television together. I agree, and I think that despite locking horns over the years, over the last decade, I think we found commonality in understanding why voters on this side of the pond had said enough is enough of typical politics as usual in America and voted in... Uh, the candidate who was most rogue, most unpolitical, and uh, elected Donald Trump. I, I think um, just based on some of the sentiments that I've heard you share, mm. I think we can agree as to why Donald Trump was elected over here. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw it coming a long way before most people did uh, with Donald Trump because I just got the feeling, travelling around middle America in particular, to the sort of heartland of America in many ways, that there was a complete disconnect between what people there were feeling about their lives and about their country and what people in New York and L.A. were assuming every, um, every, every American was thinking. In terms of how Trump is doing, I mean, I always think if you take, if you take away the tweeting and the sort of inflammatory rhetoric and actually focus purely on what he's done then Trump has actually, I would argue, had a reasonably successful two years as president, certainly by the standards of previous presidents in their first two years. The problem is you can't divorce the rhetoric and the tweeting from his actions. Well, yeah, I mean, consider what President Trump has been able to accomplish despite it being a, a, a three-against-one game going on here. You know, you have the Democrats, you have the media, uh, which is complicit to, uh, with the, the Democrat shenanigans. Consider it's three-against-one. Um, he has had a, relatively speaking, reasonably wonderful two years. I mean, it is fascinating, isn't it? Because if you ask most people in Britain, you know, he's a very divisive character here. Many of them would feel very hostile to Trump, as indeed many Americans feel very hostile to Trump. And yet I would say right now, looking at the Democrat field for 2020, I don't really see anyone there that's going to beat him. And I would lay pretty good money right now that Trump, particularly given the fact he's just been cleared of any collusion with Russia, which was this big sort of stick to beat him with, that actually at the moment I would say he'll probably get re-elected. Yeah, the Democrat candidates, that, you know, on that other side, they've really dug themselves in a hole collectively as a party. Um, they're seen as wackos over here uh, nowadays because they uh, are supporting those issues that certainly do not connect with the average man and woman in America, the families, the businesses. Um, the, uh, just the foundation of our country. They are um, radically uh, anti-child. They're pro, so pro-abortion. They're pro-illegal um, immigration, you know, and they're inviting the and incentivizing illegal immigrants to come over here. We can't afford uh, to continue the programs that we have today, much less add people to the roles of the program that more illegal immigrants would be added to. Uh, the Democrats are, they represent and support uh, more taxation on the middle class, on the working class. Uh, very, very disconnected, the party as a whole, to the people who um, really care about this nation and are activists now in this nation, activists to the degree that we said a couple of years ago, enough of it is enough of the um, politics of old, and we're going to elect someone to represent um, a new way of doing things, a new way of thinking. We elected Donald Trump, and no, nobody on the Democrat side, nobody on that ticket can, um, no, they, they don't even come close to what it is in terms of connecting to the people who um, are running the businesses that are the economic engine in this nation, who are raising their families, who are standing strong on the foundation of this country. No Democrat candidate can hold a candle to what it is that we, the people, are desiring. 
Sarah, um, I wonder if I can ask you how you found the whole experience uh, back in 2008. You were picked as a vice presidential candidate by John McCain when he ran his campaign, of course, against Barack Obama. You came in for a lot of criticism back then, um, even though you were making history, first Republican woman to be selected in that role, but you did get bashed a bit and you've been pranked uh, since. A lot of fun made of some of the interviews and comments that you've made. Did you find that a bruising experience? It's been bizarre. Uh, when I was a tap to run as the first woman VP candidate on the Republican ticket, I had nearly 90% approval rating as the governor of the largest state, and we were just kicking butt in our state with um, economic development and uh, developing our energy sources in order to feed the rest of our nation. I'm doing very, very well with my administration. And um, uh, yeah, it made sense to me and to my supporters why John McCain did tap me. But yeah, once getting out there on that um, national stage and realizing that there are so many snakes in politics, there were so many snakes in the Republican Party um, who were running the show, then uh, running the McCain campaign, and uh, allowing me to get clobbered. Um, absolutely no defense would they offer of any of the truth regarding me, my reputation, my record. Um, they were looking for someone to blame for their really crappy type of campaign that they ran, and um, I was a scapegoat. So that's just in the past, though. You know, you sometimes you win, sometimes you learn, and I certainly learned through that. What I've learned, though, is even um, more recently, having come out so early to endorse uh, Donald Trump uh, for president, and getting the crap beat out of me then, too. <laughs> Just as bad as it was back in 2008, the same degree of being hit from within the party and the media and um, th those in the Democrat Party just getting clobbered for knowing what the truth was and, the tr and speaking the truth. And the truth was that Donald Trump was the only candidate who could beat Hillary Clinton. So came out early, opened the door for other conservatives to go ahead and feel better about uh, supporting Donald Trump, and there he won. Well, I found out even then, learned from even that experience, that um, there's still a lot of snakes in the Republican Party <laughs> and in politics in general. Um, those who, you know, they're not going to have your back. They're not going to be loyal to you. They'll use you and abuse you and kick you to the side after they get out of you what they needed. What they needed from me was that endorsement. But you learn from that and um, you move on and you use those things that have happened to you personally as fuel when you go forward more passionately than ever before about making a positive contribution to the people whom you love and want to serve. How did you feel about John McCain after all this? Because he, he brought you in, he took this huge gamble, it didn't work in the end, and you were made the scapegoat, and he was quite critical, called it a big mistake in his book. And I know you said that's probably more down to the writers, but he obviously signed off on that manuscript. And you didn't go to his funeral, um, I, I noticed, a few months ago. Yeah, well, the funeral was about eight months ago. And no, I wasn't invited to the funeral. And I do believe that the negative comments that were um, uh, at least put into his mouth, I don't know if he signed off on those, because if you read his book, he was um, quite... Uh, um, complimentary about uh, me, my record, my reputation, my contribution uh, to his campaign. He and I had a perfectly fine uh, relationship. Our families had a good relationship uh, through all these years. So I was shocked when I didn't hear from him. I heard it from the media, who, of course, would love to, you know, pile on, just compound kind of the, the criticism and the, the perception of me being um, someone who, um, I guess, couldn't get along with someone like Senator McCain. Um, I heard it from the media. I didn't hear it from him that uh, he was disappointed. In fact, absolutely contrary to that. I, we always had great conversations about, wow, you know, the, the people who ran that campaign and a couple of them now are head honchos there at um, MSNBC, a really liberal outlet that are you know, still clobbering conservatives, just like they underhandedly and covertly were clobbering conservatives in that um, 2008 presidential campaign. So, no, I, you know, I'm, I am not going to believe that Senator McCain um, thought it was a mistake to have me as his running mate. Um, I do believe, though, that uh, once a person is resting in peace 
as um, you know, the dearly departed Senator McCain is, uh, I think people can kind of chill on the criticism of such a, a, a man and, and uh, you know, just kind of zip it and move on. And I, I don't like to hear all the absolutely, to me, abhorrent uh, negative comments that, that continue to go on and on and on about the man in his life. It's like, would you, guys, Sarah, would you, would you have liked to, have, would you have liked to, to have criticize. gone to the, would you have liked to have gone to the funeral to have paid respects? That's a good question. Um, sure, just because I am a respectful person, and I, you know, I, I, I would, I was able to um, correspond with Megan McCain and let her know that my family, of course, we had been praying for him through his illness, and we we're um, sorry to, um, you know, know of that loss. To the family and uh, certainly appreciated his um, efforts uh, in all those years serving in our military. I'm never going to um, speak ill of our vets. And uh, Megan McCain and I went back and forth about that, and that was nice. So I was kind of surprised to be publicly um, disinvited to the, to the uh, funeral. I think that that was an unnecessary step. They didn't have to embarrass me and embarrass others who, uh, and it wasn't just me, it was other um, good people in our campaign back in 2008 who were very, very loyal to Senator McCain and worked with him and for him for many years, and they weren't invited to the to the funeral. So that was all weird, you know, it was all, I don't know, I hope, I hope that doesn't happen to other people. It's unnecessary, it's, you know, it's kind of a, a gut punch.